everyone. Welcome to Cloud On Air, live webinars from Google Cloud. We're hosting webinars daily. You are watching From Engineer to Engineer, a show where you can hear from Google Cloud customer engineers about how to solve complex problems on GCP based on real stories from the customers. My name is Stephanie Wong. I'm a developer advocate at Google Cloud. And today we'll be talking about Networking 104, everything you need to know about load balancers on GCP. And today joining me is Ryan Prisbel, customer engineer and networking specialist. So just to mention, you can ask questions anytime on the platform and we have Googlers on standby to answer them. So take it away, Ryan. What can you tell us about load balancers? Thanks, Stephanie. So if you've seen any of the previous videos we've done, you know this is part of a series. So, so far we've covered VPCs, we've covered a lot of routing and peering, some firewalls, and now we're on to uh, number 104, which we're gonna cover load balancers today. Just as a note, I've been giving some thought to session 105, and I think I'm gonna cover DNS for that one. So if DNS is something that interests you, stay tuned and we'll get to that next. So this is our product family when it comes to load balancers. The easiest way to think about these is really, are you dealing with external load balancers, i.e. things that touch the internet, right, outside of Google Cloud, or are you dealing with internal load balancers, things that you run inside the cloud environment? The other sort of dynamic to look at these is, are they global in nature, or are they regional in nature? So all these products kind of fit in these various boxes. Load balancers are really important across the entire GCP suite of services, whether you're running Compute Engine, Kubernetes Engine, you're doing cloud storage, uh, whatever it is you're doing, load balancers can be part of the solution uh, and part of the network architecture. So I'm going to cover some of these. Uh, I can't cover everything in depth in the time we have, but I'll cover what I can. And then I'm also going to show you how to actually set up a load balancer as well. So let's get started with network load balancers, right? So these are load balancers that are really operating at the network layer, right? So when I say that, they're operating at layer three and layer four, right? These are external load balancers, right? So we talked about external versus internal. These are facing the internet. And these are regional load balancers. So what I mean by that is they operate within Google Cloud regions. So in this example, I'm showing a number of users with, that are running a number of apps that are running inside GCP. In each of these, they're running in a different region. So you can see myapp.com is running in US West, uh, test.com is running in uh, Europe, and travel.com is running in Asia. So those are various regions for Google Cloud. In each case, I have a load balancer running in that region that is receiving traffic from customers on the internet and pushing them to, in this case, you know, myapp.com or test.com on the backside. So let me go over sort of network load balancers at a very high level so you can understand the features that come along with these. So they are regional. Um, they are highly available. They do run across multiple zones. They are designed to really load balance TCP and UDP traffic. So as we'll talk about next, uh, our layer seven load balancers, these are really operating at the network layer, right? So when you're dealing with higher layer protocols like SSL or HTTP, all that stuff just passes through here, right? So if you're running things like SSL, your backends need to be able to terminate that because the load balancers aren't gonna do it for you. One of the common questions we get asked is about client side IP. In, the, in terms of the network load balancers, the client IP is preserved. So when we talk about the layer seven load balancers, that isn't the case, and we get into the concept we call X forward four headers and different ways that you can manipulate that. But in terms of this, the network load balancer, the client IP is actually passed directly through the load balancer. So it's not terminating sessions, it's not changing anything. Because of that, you can actually use the VPC firewall constructs that we talked about in a previous video to actually enforce security policy. So if there's a regional IP block that you don't want to allow or something that you want to whitelist, you can use the firewall rules to actually control that because the client IPs are being preserved so it passes through. In terms of how does it actually load balance the traffic, right? It can use either a two, three, or five tuple hashing mechanism. So if you're using a five tuple, it's based on uh, source IP, desk IP, uh, source port, desk port, and protocol. If you're using a three tuple, it's source IP, desk IP, and protocol. And if you're using just a two tuple hash, that's just basically source IP and desk IP. It also maintains session affinity based on the IP address. So session affinity is something that comes up a lot when we talk about load balancers. So just know in terms of the network load balancer, it's really basing that on, on the IP address. Uh, it does support HTTP health checks in terms of the backends. And these are very high performance, highly scalable devices, right? They can handle you know, a million plus requests per second. So it's not something you really have to worry about like how scalable are these things. Yeah. I think what's, you touch on a bunch of things here. You're able to still enable that security by using the firewall rules that you would apply to the VPC subnet itself. 
Yep. So that doesn't change. Um, and then also, this is kind of the way that you're able to scale your entire environment. Yep, exactly. And because it's a network layer, it's very transparent in terms of traffic that's coming in and getting pushed to the back ends. Right. So a lot of customers really like that function. So I'm going to move into sort of our layer seven load balancers. So our, what we call our HTTP load balancers or our Google Cloud load balancers. Um, first, I want to talk about DNS load balancing. This is a topic that comes up a lot with customers to say, why don't we use DNS load balancing as far as you know, how our preferred mechanism or recommended way to solve this problem. So the challenge with DNS-based load balancing is kind of what I've illustrated here. Right? So if you're running multiple backends and they're running in various regions, what you have to do is you have various DNS records that are pointing to these various regions. There's a lot of things in there that are outside of your control. right? So for example, you could have a failure in, say, San Francisco. right? You've got to update the DNS, potentially. You could have people that have stale DNS entries. So even if they're pounding away on this and it's not available, they don't have the most current DNS records. So there's lots of things that are outside of your control, per se. right? And when things fail, guess what? You've got to go back and update this stuff. So for example, if San Francisco fails, you have to make a change so that you re redirect all the traffic to another region. So it's not saying that you can't use DNS-based load balancing. It's just not the way that Google has chosen to do it. We looked at this model and said, when you're running something globally, how can we do this that's different? How can we improve on this model? Right. So this is Google's sort of answer to this. So this is our layer seven load balancer. And this is a really powerful construct, right? I always like to tell customers, this is like an indie car that Google built that we just gave them the keys for. Um, the reason I say that is because this is the same load balancer that we use for Gmail, for YouTube, for our search engine. We didn't build this as a product to say, hey, cloud, go sell this. We built this because we needed to just to make Google function. So right. really, it is this indie car that we built in Google infrastructure that we've said, hey, go take it for a spin around the track. Yeah, I was about to ask whether or not this is built on the original infrastructure that we're using previously yep. for our billion plus user products. Exactly. So the way this works, and the way this is very different, is to start off, you have one VIP globally. So in this case, if you're running myapp.com, in that regional construct, you had a different IP for every region. In this case, you're using 200.1.1.1 in this case, right? So whether you're in Asia, whether you're in Europe, whether you're in America, you're always hitting that same IP, right? So what happens is when you come in, we're advertising a global set of blocks. So the various ISPs, the way that you get to Google, or when I say you, the way customers get to Google to sort of access your myapp.com, is they're going to come in from the internet somewhere. So it's going to hit one of our load balancers, and our load balancer is actually going to look at all the backends you've configured on the backside, and it's actually going to figure out what is the closest one to it. So maybe you're running one on east-west coast, and you have somebody come in from Europe, and it's going to push it to the, west, or to the east coast. Um, if you're running it in all regions, then if it comes in in Europe, it's going to land it in Europe. So net net, it gives your customer better performance because they actually get routed to the back ends that are closest to them. Right. And this kind of reminds me of like CDN as well. Yeah, it's, it's very similar. So our CDN actually kind of lays parallel to this. When you have CDN content, this is the first thing you hit, and then right. it redirects it over to a CDN to serve what the customer is right. asking for. But this is sort of in concept how it works. You can see Maya, Bob, and Shen in this example, they're all hitting the same IP, and they're all getting pushed to serving backends right, in their various regions. Now, this is probably one of our most popular things that we sell in terms of, of load balancing, because it just is so powerful. Lots of customers, even if they're running their own load balancer stacks, love the fact that we can have an Anycast VIP globally right. Right, that they can leverage here. So they might stack this load balancer on the edge and then put their load balancers behind it. I see. It also has, you know, when we talk about DDoS, when we talk about all this other stuff, right, this is what sits at our edge. This is what helps protect against a lot of that stuff. So right. again, it's a very powerful construct. And just to reiterate, you mentioned the single Anycast IP. Yep. Why is that so beneficial and such a differentiator for us? So the big thing there is you don't have to deal with the DNS piece of it, right? So yeah. in the case I showed you before, you have an IP address for one region, IP address for another region, IP address for another region. If a region fails, you have to update DNS records. You have to make sure those DNS records get propagated out, right? right? In this case, you only have one IP, right? So you never have to do any sort of updating to the DNS records for this to function. You're always hitting, in this case, 200.1.1.1, mm -hmm. right? So no matter where you are in the world, you're always hitting that same IP, and you're letting Google handle what region to push it to that's closest to your customer to right. give you the best customer experience. In terms of our load balancer, and you mentioned this because we have regional load balancer as well, but we have high availability built into it. Exactly. You can think of these as many, many processes that are running on Google's Edge, right? So as part of like how we manage DDoS and how we sort of handle that, right? You can think of these as a process. So when we need more of these, what do we do? Well, we spin up more of these processes. So it's right. kind of, in a way, I don't want to say infinitely scalable because nothing's infinitely scalable, right. but it's very highly scalable because as we need more, we instantly 
instantaneously spin up more of these load balancers to yeah. handle the incoming load. And this is all based on our Google front end, and that's kind of the technology that yep. it's, it's Sometimes you hear us of. use the term GFE, it's right. for Google front end. That's our internal terminology for our, our global cloud load balancer. Yes. So I want to get into sort of the data model. How do you actually build these things, right? How do they function? So on the left-hand side, you have the internet, right? This is where all your customers are coming in. The first thing, it's going to be a global forwarding rule, right? How are you going to forward these, right? So you know, www.stephanie.com might forward to one backend, and www.stephanie.com slash you know, buy my cool stuff might forward to a different backend, right? So when we talk about those forwarding rules, this is what we're talking about. How do you forward based on the URLs, mm -hmm. OK? This is going to direct them to that target proxy where you actually build the URL maps, right? right? And then those map to backend services, right? So it could be you know, a web page. It could be a shopping cart. It could be you know, anything that you put out on the internet, right? So that is your backend service. And then those backend services really live in what we call managed instance groups, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll talk a bit more about those when I set those up. But effectively, you can consider those like a, a scalable, highly available way of running that sort of back end, right? So mm -hmm. whether that be that web server that you're trying to get to or you know, that shopping application that you're running, right? They're really running in that on top of that managed instance group. And then as we talked about earlier, we've got firewall rules. Firewall rules are in place in here too to help control traffic. Now in this case, you're not using the firewall rules like you were at the network load balancer because the client IP, as I mentioned before, isn't passed through. The client actually terminates at our load balancer. So it does SSL termination, it does other stuff, terminates the session there, opens a new session on the backside. Right? So everything is private IPs inside. The only public facing IPs are really what's facing out to the internet and what the customers are talking to, right? right. I mean, your end customers, not you particularly. Mm -hmm. and, and just to go back that, to that for just a second, you, you just mentioned internal IPs, and that, that reminds me of what you're about to talk about, which is internal load balancing. At what yep. stage does it kind of become from external so a, a to internal? A good way to think about that, it's a very good question. So let's take a shopping cart application, right? So your shopping cart application may be published on the internet. So you put that behind the load balancer. The load balancer is the public IP for your application. Customers come in from the internet, they hit that application, right? Now that application has to access inventory. It has to access a shopping cart right. sort of backend. It has to act all these other things to function, mm -hmm. okay? It will use the internal load balancer to then dovetail into all those other applications running on the backside. So you're using the global ILB up front to access that that web page or that shopping cart, and the shopping cart is using the internal load balancers to access all those other things on the back end Got that it. it needs to function. Right. Okay, so let's run through some of the features that are really tied to our layer seven load balancer. So we talked about the single global Anycast VIP, right? And this can be IPv4 or IPv6, right? And it runs globally. Worldwide capacity, we talked about this, right? These are processes that run out at Google's Edge. They're highly scalable. And like I said, we use these for things like our search engine. So we know they're tried, they're tested, they run really well. Cross-region failover and fail back. So this is kind of what I was talking about earlier. You might have instances running in all regions, but if, say, something fails in Europe, guess what? The load balancer knows Europe is not in commission at the moment. I'm going to fail that to, say, the east coast of the U.S. because that's the next closest region. Or if you're in the you know, west coast of the U.S. and it fails, it's going to say, oh, I know my next closest is the central region. So all those, all that intelligence lives with the load balancer and it figures out how do I get it to the closest back end to ultimately give your customer the best experience. Awesome. We talked about auto scaling in terms of like how we use these with like DDoS and various other things, right? So it's incredibly quick. Um, it's also a single point to apply global policies, right? So we talked about URLs, various sort of security policies you can overlay on it. We're mm -hmm. not going to talk about Cloud Armor here, but Cloud Armor sort of works in function with this. If you want to whitelist or blacklist IP blocks, mm -hmm. all that stuff works in conjunction over the top of these layer seven load balancers. Okay. And again, super robust, millions of queries per second, right? They wouldn't function for our search engine if we didn't have that sort of capability in there. Right. Okay. So, as you said, I'm going to pivot to the internal load balancers, right? So these are things that are not facing the internet. They're not facing externally. These are facing, you know, typically you can think of like VM to VM inside your cloud environment. So one of the key things to understand here is there really is no load balancer, right? When you go and configure a load balancer, you're actually configuring the control plane, right? Our SDN control plane. Mm -hmm. It's not like you're building a box that's running on top of a VM, right? Because um, that would create a bottleneck, right? right? So by basically allowing you to program the SDN directly, when packets come in and they need to be load balanced, the SDN just sort of looks at them and goes, oh, I know that there's four backends for this. I'm going to pick one, 
and I'm going to send it to the back end, right? It doesn't actually forward it to a load balancer. The load balancer doesn't make a load balancing decision and then forward it to one of the VMs, right? So, you know, why we chose to do that is, again, we don't want a single point of failure in there. Right. We don't want something that can fail. When we start talking about the SDN and the control plane, if it's failing, we have other very larger issues that we're right. dealing with. So the data model on this looks a little bit different, right? So in this case, you have a client VM. So like I said, your shopping cart application. You have IP addresses, right? So backends, what VMs are they? Um, what IPs, what ports, protocols are you using on them? Um, the serving capacity and the instance health. We'll talk about managed instance groups when I show you how to actually configure these things. But effectively, that managed instance group is going to be health checked, right? So what do I mean when I say health check? Like we're actually probing it to say, is the instance or instances healthy? If the instance in the group is not healthy, let's auto heal it, right? So we'll actually spin it back up and, you know, if let's say you're running two and one fails, we'll spin up another one and now you've got your two again. It also allows you to dynamically scale these, right? So if you think about, uh, let's say Black Friday is a really good example, right? I'm running a whole bunch of backends and I get a whole bunch of customer traffic hitting, you know, my shopping app. Well, you need more backends, you can set the managed instance group to scale the stuff horizontally, right? To build more backends for you dynamically to allow you to scale that traffic up. The great thing about it is it dynamically scales up. When traffic goes away, it dynamically will scale that back down. Right. So and you set all that stuff up. That's incredible because that, again, if you can scale down to one, let's say at minimum, then you are you know, achieving a lot more cost savings that way. Yep. It's a really good point. I always recommend running two. So if one yeah. fails, there's always one available. So I kind of consider two the minimum. But yeah, you're right. You can actually set up just one if yeah. you want to. Yeah. And here it's like these are homogenous VMs, like let's say an app server. Mm -hmm. And it gives you A, failover capabilities and the ability to auto scale based on health checks or whatever configuration that you set, right? Based yep. on VM utilization or CPU utilization, for example. Exactly. So now we're going to talk about some of the features for these network load balancers. These are the internal load balancers, right? So just like the external load balancers, they work on a VIP, right? So there's going to be an IP address assigned to them. So when traffic is coming from your front end, like your shopping cart app, and it's going to the back ends, it's going to go to a VIP, right? So you may have five VMs that are the back ends, but they're all nested behind that single VIP, mm -hmm. right? So what really happens is the SDN will say, oh, I see, I know that VIP is configured as a load balancer. I know these five VMs are on the backside, and it's going to pick one of them, send it. The VM's going to receive it. It's going to see, oh, this isn't my IP address per se, but it's a, it's a VIP that I know that I'm the back end from a load balancer. So I can receive that packet. I can process that packet, and I can respond to that packet. We talked a little bit about health checks, TCP, HTTP, HTTPS health checks. This is really sort of what, uh, what it uses to check and make sure those back ends are healthy. Um, in this case, the client IP is preserved. So we talked about that because you're dealing with VM to VM here in, in mm -hmm. most cases, right? So we're maintaining VM A's IP address when you send to those backends, right? right? So that's really what we're saying when we say the client IP is preserved, is really the VM IP. And we talked about there's really no, there's no middle proxy. There's no actual sort of choke point in this, right? Because you are configuring the SDN directly, right? So that's how we deliver super highly scalable capacity here to do this where there is no sort of choke points or, or things that can break yeah, in the middle of It's not a server, it's not a VM, it's not a physical device. That yeah, you know, if you've using. configured like F5 load balancers or something in your data center, it's a physical device that yeah, you put in there. In this exactly. case, there's nothing physical about it, it's just a control plane configuration. Right. Right, so it's, it's very elegant it's in its a simplicity. It's different way of thinking, honestly, with the SDN. Yeah, involved. there's a lot of stuff that Google does that really we embody this theory of, um, you know, why make it more complex than we have to? If we can simplify and make it more elegant and, yeah. and and simple, let's go, you know, let's do that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that's my high level overview of this. Um, now I'm actually going to take you into configuring a load balancer. So since our global load balancers, the Layer 7 ones, the IndyCar Ferraris I was sort of talking about are probably, you know, a very common used application, um, I'm going to take you through how to configure one of those. So. If you have ever been in our console, you'll recognize this as sort of the homepage of the console. So in configuring a global load balancer, you have to actually do a few things before I configure the load balancer. We talked a lot about managed instance groups, right? I didn't really touch on them super in depth, but I'm going to show you how to actually configure a managed instance group because that's what you use to put behind the load balancer, or what I used in, in my case, okay? So let's go and look at that. So when you click on Compute Engine, you're going to see instance groups and instance templates. Before you can build a managed instance group, you have to have a template for the VM that's going to be in the group because the group basically will spawn copies of that particular VM that you specify, right? So okay. it's not like 
you can have five different types of VMs, right? So if you say VM A looks like this, the managed instance group might be five VM A's, right? right? The instant template is going to find what does VM A look like, okay? So that's the first place we're going to go. Now, I've pre-built one because it takes some time to update these things, specifically when you go and do the actual load balancing configuration. Because like I said, we have thousands of these processes running out there. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine how long it takes to push all these new configs out to all this right. stuff, right? So I, uh, I intentionally pre-configure this stuff so you wouldn't have to wait for me for five minutes and watch <laughs> little things spin around. Yeah. But I'm going to show you how to create an instance template. So here we go. So this is an instance template. And as I said, you're basically configuring a VM here, right? So you're going to give your VM a name. You're going to give your VM a type, right? So whether it's N1 standard and F1 micro, if you've done anything in Compute Engine, these are all things that are familiar to you. You can set things like boot disks, um, identity and access management. These are the service accounts. All this stuff can be set. I'm not going to go too much into detail on these. Uh, you can set automatic firewall rules that will be created to allow HTTP and HTTPS. And then you've got this ability to go in here and sort of define some of the networking parameters. So I'm going to go specifically into networking. So in this case, I've created a network. In this case, it's load balance demo network. So I would pick that. And then I would pick a subnet that's in that network, right? So what I'm telling it is all these VMs are going to live in that VPC in that particular subnet that I've created. OK. Can you actually have a managed instance group with VMs in different regions? Um, you could run things where they're in different regions. Um, in this case, I set everything up in US Central, right? Because this is a global load balancer, so you can build those backends. I was saying you can build the instance group so it actually spans. Right. You'd actually build probably an instance group in like the central region, another instance group in the west region. Right, OK. But, Individual but instance groups in different regions and yeah. have the global load balancer distribute between those. Yep. So there's a whole bunch of other configurations in here. I'm not going to go through every one of these in depth. Um, you can play with these at, at your will. But this is how you create a template. So again, this is sort of the first step, right? So I'm going to go back. So this is this is the specific template that I built in this case. So you can see I'm running an N1 standard. It shows it's in use by something. I have some firewall rules set up for it. It's got an ephemeral external IP address. Service tiers I'll talk about in just a minute, whether it's premium or not. So these are all the configurations I just sort of showed you. But this is this, this is the instance template that I used. So once you have an instance template, now we're going to create the managed instance group itself. So Here's the managed instance group that I created. But to create your own, you'd go up here and create instance group. So you're going to, you have the option of managed or unmanaged. I talked about things like health checking. I talked about things like auto scaling. I talked about things like auto healing. That's all part of the managed instance group because you're, you're letting Google manage all that stuff for you. right? Mm -hmm. So in this case, I created a managed instance group. So I'm going to give it a name, whether I want it to live in a single zone or multiple zones. So I would pick, in my case, I configured something in US Central 1. You can configure various zones in there, the A, B, C, D uh, redundancy zones. And then here, you see it requires instance template. This is why I had to build the instance template before I could build the managed instance. Okay. Group. So Got here's it. where I would grab that template that I just built, click on it, say this is the template I want you to use as you build and scale this managed instance group. Auto scaling, because I've got a managed instance group, so I'm setting auto scaling on. It's auto scaling based on CPU utilization, but there's different things that you can do. So in this case, I just pick CPU utilization. Okay. I specify the percentage. So once it exceeds an aggregate, so if I say I'm running three VMs, once the aggregate CPU utilization exceeds 60%, it will spin up another one, spin up a fourth okay. one, right, and add it to the pool. In this case, I've told it the maximum number of instances I want to run is 10. So I might say here, let's say a minimum of three, maximum of 10. OK. Good okay. to know so you don't wake up and there's 1,000 running. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah. The cooldown period is actually how much time it takes to spin this up. So depending mm. on your VM and what you have configured on it, right? So if you're running a bunch of startup scripts or you're bootstrapping that or you're loading a bunch of stuff on right. the VM, the VM could take longer to start up. So okay. this is effectively how long you want it to wait before it starts pulling that thing to get information out of it. Oh, right? Okay. So right now, the default is set for 60 seconds. And then I talked about auto healing. So this is like, like I mentioned, if the device were to fail, so if the VM fails, so one of your three, let's say, were to fail, it won't just go down to two. It will recreate that one, right? Because again, we define the template. So it can just go to the template, say, I need to create another one of these devices. Create another one and boom, you're back to three. Okay. Right? But that's why I always kind of recommend running a minimum of two. Yeah. Right? So if one fails, one's always running. Nothing saying you couldn't just run one. If it fails, then for 
say you've got a bunch of stuff on there and bootstrapping it takes three minutes from yeah. three minutes you'd be completely down. So basically you just have another VM at least running just so it could fail over more quickly than having exactly. to spin There's, up in a fresh exactly. VM. So you wouldn't have to wait the three minutes while right. you know brought up another VM. So that's why I always sort of say best practice is to run two of these. That's the whole kind of purpose of the managed instance group is to allow for failures but still yeah. have resources have to, back up there. To, yeah. to deal mm-hmm. with stuff. So in this case, I can set the different types of health checks that I want. And then I would just click create and that would create this managed instance group. So I'm going to go back here. So as I said, I've already created a managed instance group. So we can click on it and we'll look and see what I set up. So in this case, I'm running two different VMs, right? Uh, and you can see the templates that I used. That was the template I built initially. Mm-hmm. Um, you can see when I created them, I created these back in May. You can see I specified US Central C and US Central B. So I'm spreading these across the VM redundancy zones in our US Central 1 data okay. center. And then you can see there's internal IPs and external IPs for these, right? Now, I do want to show you, if you go over to VM instances, you will see these show up, right? So these are that same sort of VMs, okay? So what I did to show you sort of load balancing, in most cases, you would build, say, a template that, let's just say it's a web server, Mm -hmm. okay? You'd build three copies of it. Well, if I'm showing you load balancing, and it's load balancing the same three copies of the web server, I can't really show you that it's actually working, right? right? So what I did is I built these two VMs, and I went and I loaded Apache on one, and I loaded an Nginx, basic Nginx proxy config on the other. That way you can actually see. So what I'm going to show you, so if I grab this 47 IP address, right? let me go over here. You can see, there's my Apache that I set up. Okay. And if you go back here, and you grab the 50, There's my Nginx. Perfect. Right? Yeah. So now I can actually show you that it's actually load balancing. When I show you the load balancing in Fig we'll and demo to this thing, you'll be able to tell. I'll show you how it's flipping back and forth. Yes. But if it was in normal cases, you wouldn't do this. You would say build three <laughs> copies of your same you know, web application so right. that it's load balancing across all three and it's completely transparent to your end users, right, or your clients, like what's actually happening on the backside. But again, it doesn't look like much if I just show you the same three pages, I could be <laughs> tricking you and really you just have one thing running. Exactly. So I didn't want to do that. Okay. So as I said, if you go back to VMs, you'll actually see the VMs running in here. Right? So I just want to point that out. So we went, we built the templates, we built the instance groups. Now we're actually going to build the load balancer itself. Right? So we're going to go to this. And again, here's the load balancer already set up, but I'm going to go through and create a load balancer for you. Right? So as I said, we're creating a layer seven, a GCLB load balancer. So that is this. I'm going to start that configuration from the internet to my VMs. So these are all the configuration profiles that you have to set up to actually set up the load balancer, right? So we're going to use all the other stuff we already created, but this is the actual, when we talk about the load balancer config, this is what we're really talking about. Okay. So let's go through it. So first, we need to set up the backends, right? So in this case, you could use buckets if you had buckets set up, but in my case, I am running services. So I'm going to create the backend service, right? Or I already created that backend service, right? So I showed you the managed instance group, which is really the backend service. This was the managed instance group I created, right? The web backends. So in this case, I can just click on it, but let's go and create a service, right? So you're going to give it a name. You can pick whether you want to use instance groups or endpoints. In this case, it shows the uh, instance group that I had already set up. It's an HTTP load balancer, so port number is going to be 80. Okay. In this case, I set those up, the, the managed instance groups, as utilization, if you recall. Remember I said yes. 60%? So it's pulling all the information and it's saying, okay, utilization, what do I want the CPU utilization to be? Um, so this is sort of you know, an easy way to just sort of set this up using all the other stuff I've already configured. Perfect, right? yeah. So this is really just, like I said, configuring that back end. Okay, let me cancel out of that. Okay, so now we talked about host and path rules, right? So this is where I was telling you like www.stephanie.com, mm-hmm. you know, is one page and then www.stephanie.com forward slash buy my cool stuff is directing to another Correct. instance group, right. right? So this is where you're setting all of this stuff up, right? So in this case, you can say the default will be any, any matched, right? So anything that comes into stephanie.com, regardless of whether it's backslash images or backslash buy my stuff, right? It's going to go to the back end. So in this case, let me go back here and do this real quick. Let me grab that. Okay. So I set that, set that up. 
So now you can see it populates it here. Okay. So you could have you know, stephanie.com, a backend service for that. You could have stephanie.com forward slash buy my stuff being a different app that you're running, which yeah. would be a different managed Back instance group, right. right? So then you would just add a path rule. You could say, you know, we said, w dot, or we'll call it uh, web.stephanie.com forward slash buy my stuff. And then I could set a different backend service. Now, in this case, I've only created one backend service, right? But yes. you could create other ones, if right? So other ones this running. is where you're mapping. We talked about those URL maps. Right. This is where you're actually setting all of those things up. Got it. Okay. So let me just go and delete this real quick. Get rid of that. Okay. So now we're talking about the front end, right? So this is, this is the actual load balancer itself, that front end load balancer. So we're going to give it a name. It's an HTTP or HTTPS load balancer. I'm going to just make this, keep it really simple, make it an HTTP load balancer. Premium versus standard tier. This has to do with Google's backbone, right? So I told you I'd mentioned this earlier. I told you I'd talk about it. So really what this is, is Google has a philosophy of we want to control your traffic as much as possible in terms of the user experience, right? Mm -hmm. So if you select premium network, what that means is if you have something in, say, the East Coast, but the user's on the West Coast, we're going to use Google's backbone to deliver that traffic all the way to the West Coast, right? Because when it's on our backbone, we control that quality, right? We can make sure that that packet is not getting bogged down in the internet or being congested by things. So that's what premium tier is. Now, standard tier was designed to help cost manage this stuff, right? So what happens in standard tier, let's take our East Coast origination device. Mm -hmm. It would say dump it off to an ISP in the East Coast. That ISP would pick up that packet and take it all the way to the West Coast. But again, you're not using Google's backbone. Right. You're just using the internet at large. Right. Okay. So that's the difference here. So I'm going to leave it as premium. Okay. Say as IPv4. It's going to front address port 80. Okay. And that's pretty much it. Right. So I would review and finalize this. So once I would click create, it's going to take a few minutes to create all this stuff, and it's going to have to roll it out to all those load balancers out there. Right. This is where I didn't want you to sit and watch this thing spin for the next you know, five, 10 minutes. Um, so I'm going to go back. But I will show you, this is the load balancer that I created. Right. So we talked about how to set up all this stuff, right? HTTP, here's the IP that was reserved for it. So okay. We'll grab that in a second. I set up as premium tier. And this shows you sort of all the backends okay. that are behind it, right? So it shows you it's an instance group where it's running. Two out of two instances are healthy, right? So I set up all the health checking when I did this. So it's, right. it's constantly pulling this stuff to make sure it's healthy. CPU utilization at 60%. Max utilization at 80%. It's pretty much the configuration. And that's the IP that you're directing traffic to. Correct. This is the external IP address that's facing external. Right. Right. So users would be hitting that. Exactly. Myapp.com right. would sort of use this IP okay. address. Okay. And again, single Anycast IP. That's yep. the only one that you would need. Yep. So if, when you're in this screen, you can quickly look and look at your backends, right? So this is going to show you my backend that I've built, right? It's a backend service. There's the name of it. I can click on it and get some details. It's an HTTP backend. This shows your load balancer again, that actual front end load balancer. Right. So I'm going to grab this IP at this point, copy it. Let me see if my load balancer checked in. Here's what your config looks like if everything is healthy. See this green check? Yep. Right? One back end service, one instance group, everything's working, right? So you get this nice green check mark, right? In that instance group, you can look here. Uh, if you click on this, you can sort of see graphical representations of traffic. I've got really nothing hitting on this, but you know it's one instance group back there. Yeah. And if you recall, when I set up the instance group, I set it up for two. So we're yeah. running two, right? So as you recall, one's the Nginx, mm -hmm. one's the Apache. Okay. Now I'm going to close these out. Okay. So what I did is I copied. Uh, let's see. Where is it? I'm going to copy this IP. So remember, this is the IP of the load balancer. Go back here. Going to run that bad boy. There's my Apache. Okay. I refresh it. There's my Nginx. There's my Apache. I'm just keep hitting. I'm just yeah. hitting refresh. You can see it's just bouncing it's, between. Wow, them. it's uh, pretty much like 50-50. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's kind of switching between them, but it's kind of going back and yeah. forth. But you know, but you can see in this case, right? Like I'm trying to demonstrate it. Like you wouldn't really set it up this way. You'd want your web page to right. up every time, right? Or yeah. your shopping cart. But it's, it's like a representation of how, you know, you would be 
balancing the load between exactly. the number of exactly. backends this, that you this have. This is a really good way to right. just visualize, right? Like yeah. how it's actually doing this. I'm just I just keep hitting it. Yeah. You can just see it, you know, continue to bounce around between these things. Right. Right. And so and so the the front end load balancer that you just created, that's handling that's being handled by our global load balancer. Yep, the GCLB as we call it. The internal load balancer is what we first created using the managed instance yeah, group. In this case template. I didn't use the ILB at all. I just have this this is really just a web page okay, sitting it. behind a GCLB, right? Now if this was like a shopping cart app or this was a you know, say a, a store like Etsy or something like that, mm -hmm. right? You know, and I wanted to click on things to go buy things, that would then use the ILB potentially to I dovetail see. into other things on the backside. But Got for it. purposes of this, I'm just showing you that front end okay. and how yeah. it's changing and load balancing the traffic. Got it. Understood. Right? But if you were, like I said, Etsy or something like that, you know, this would always look like Etsy's homepage every time. Got it. So that's pretty much how to configure a global load balancer. Thank you so much. That was super helpful. I know it was a highly requested topic. Uh, much more to talk about in the next Networking 105. Um, so that's that's it for the presentation portion of the talk. So please stay tuned because we're going to come back for frequently asked questions. We'll be back in less than a minute. Thanks again. All right, so we're back with some FAQ. The first being whether you know, our load balance actually require pre-warming to scale, because I know that's a concern that some people have. Yeah, we get have. that question a lot, and some of that comes from legacy products that are out there in the industry, yeah. right? where you've got to define things. right? Um, I think the key note to that is, the key answer is no, you don't have to. right? But part of this is because, again, we built these load balancers as not a product for cloud to sell, but for things like our search engine function. So as you can imagine, if there was you know, a disaster someplace in the world in the next 10 seconds, I can't predict that, yeah. right? And we would get you know, just tons of searches of like, what's going on in country X that just happened? Or I heard something great on the news that I need to research, right? So it would be impossible for us to sort of do any sort of pre-warming, right? So this is why you know, these things that were built as a product, right? They, they have some of those limitations in it, but when we built our global load balancer, this just wouldn't have worked for us, right? Yeah. It just wouldn't have worked for our search engine. It wouldn't have worked for YouTube when things go viral, right? Yeah. So the ultimate answer is no, you don't have to do it, but a lot of it's because of just the Google engineering that went into this and how this was not developed as a product for right. cloud, but rather something we use to just make Google's infrastructure work, right? Yeah. It is that sort of linchpin device for us. Yeah, and I think you mentioned, you know, in the presentation that we're not, we're straying away from focusing or basing it off a DNS approach. We're using our global front end for the external. For the internal, it's not proxy based. Um, it's using our software defined networking. So that's kind of like what enables us to be able to not require the pre-warming. Yep. It's not based on physical servers as we talked about. Yep. Um, so the next one, okay, so we mentioned premium versus standard networking. And you you talked about how you know premium utilizes the Google network backbone and it gives us higher bandwidth and throughput, and standard is for cost savings. So um, for the front end specifically, front end load balancer, can you do premium tier for both like global and regional? Yeah, you can set up either premium or standard tier for either load balancers, right? And like I said, it's it's really done to sort of cost manage traffic more than anything, right? Google has built this great big network and we want you to be able to use it, right? So we love for you know people to use premium tier because it just gives a better user experience in our view of the world, right? But we also understand that customers are trying to cost optimize traffic sometimes, right? So that's why we created sort of that standard tier where you can say, hey, Google, you have this great backbone, but it's just, it costs more money than you want to spend on this traffic. So dump it off to the internet as quickly as you possibly can and you know, let it sort of go through the internet and go through all of the cost structure that is very right. complex in, in terms of that, yeah. right? Depending on the uh, use case. Yeah, like but that, it yeah. isn't sort of, you know, you can set it up in a lot of the different fashions. Whenever you, you you'll see premium versus standard in a lot of the load balancer configurations, right? Okay. Specifically the external facing ones, because the internal ones, remember, it's all just writing on Google's, it's meant to be inside of VPC, so it's all writing internal to Google. Right. It's not something that ever touches the internet. So okay. it's really all of the, as I said before, early on, the first slide, right? You can think of internal services versus external services. The premium standard only applies to external load balancing services. Okay, understood. Great. 
Uh, next one. So the, L, the load balancer is high availability or highly available. What can you do to increase the availability of your backends? So this is where the managed instance groups come in, right? This is the whole point of the managed instance groups, right? You're building highly available and highly redundant managed instance groups, right? So as I was talking about with the GCLB, you could build managed instance groups in every region and it'll find the closest one, right? Um, and that's what gives you that sort of highly available, highly scalable, right? I like to talk about Black Friday as a good use case for this, right? If you're in the retail industry, if you do anything versus purchasing, that is the day you have to engineer around, right? right? Everybody engineers around Black Friday. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't make sense, right? Why do you want to run a thousand servers or why do you want to run a thousand load balancers that get used, you know, call it one week a year, yeah. right? So that's where the managed instance groups come in. It gives you that scalability and that that protection from a highly available standpoint where if something fails, we spin it back up because you're letting Google manage that infrastructure, yeah. right? So that whole concept of using a managed instance group is really designed around making highly available backend infrastructure. Awesome. Great. Okay. Uh, I think this is the last one. How about connection draining for backend instances to reduce disruption to end users? Like, you know, let's say you want to move from one backend to another without any kind of uh, poor experience for the user. Yep. So this is another common question, right? So when we do auto scaling and things scale up, right? So let's use our Black Friday example, right? Midnight happens, a sale goes on, and you get bombarded with all this traffic. So you scale up to you know ten servers on the backside, right? Mm -hmm. There's a there's a, a variable in the in the configuration that I didn't show that basically says what is the draining period, right? So I think it defaults to three hundred seconds. Okay. So what's going to happen is as traffic starts to ramp down, yeah, right. So let's say maybe four o'clock in the morning. You know, you you got your initial barrage. You scaled up to meet with it, you to meet that demand. Now things start to to sort of fall off, right? When it sees the utilization go down, what it's going to do is it's going to say, okay, all new connections. I'm going to drain this this backend, right? So I'm not going to put any new connections on there. I'm going to wait 300 seconds before I take it out of the pool, right? Okay. So let sessions finish. Let sessions yeah. like drain off of it, and then because it's not putting any new ones on it, it's putting new ones over here. Yeah. Once it's down, it'll pull that one down and it'll keep doing that and scaling down as your load decreases. That's great because right? then they don't experience like a just cut off and then you know we're still kind of spinning up this yeah, instance it's, it's, and directing it's very traffic. intelligent in terms of like it knows oh I'm in a cool down period right where I need to scale this stuff back yeah. and it does so in a very intelligent way right it doesn't just say oh you know I'm going to go back to two dump all these other five then I spun up and yeah. strand all these customers. So it's like slowly redirecting traffic and users to the yep. other one. That's great. And, and like I said you can figure that sort of stuff yeah. when, you're, when you're setting these things up. Awesome. This is super helpful. Thank you so much again, Ryan. Yeah. Thank you everyone for tuning in today. And again, don't forget, please visit the Cloud on Air website for more content from Google Cloud experts. And we'll see you again next time.